Hello everyone, we're at Connect Tech and we're talking about UI architecture and I have Scott Davis with me today. Uh, so Scott, introduce yourself. Hi, my name's uh, Scott Davis. I'm a principal engineer and web architect with uh, ThoughtWorks. So Scott, what do you think a UI architect does? So this is a great question because the web has historically been this really powerful technology that no one devotes any time to actually learning. Um, they're like, HTML is so easy, I don't need to take any formal classes. But then if you don't understand the technology, we find that we have many, many div-driven, span-driven developers, and those elements are semantically void. We need to be using headers and paragraphs and, and semantic elements so that we can go on to conversational UIs. We can have conversations about accessibility and these things. So a UI architect is someone who's interested in not only get information on the screen so the pixels look good, but we have to have a broader approach to this. We have to understand HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, all three. It's that important. And I love it when developers come to me and say, oh, I'm, I'm, not a web app, I'm not a web developer. I gave away the punchline, didn't I? I'm not a web developer. I'm a web app developer. And I say, oh, good. All right. So you already know HTML, CSS, and JavaScript, right? I know JavaScript. OK, well, you got more to learn there. Right. And then when we talk about apps, it also includes accessibility. It includes performance. It includes privacy and security. And once we start having good conversations about those aspects, and right. testing, and usability, and all of these things, so it is great that we have really strong web developers out there. But when you step up to a UI architect, you're trying to consider the entire package, just not the focus of getting pixels on your screen. Right. That's a, actually a very great uh, and kind of all-in-one definition of a UI architect. So w when we think of, for example, a let's say just a senior front-end web app developer. Yes. Right, since you use the word web app. What are some of the other skills that you need aside from just being, you know, the guy who codes or, you know, the woman who designs or, you know, whatever, right? Like, what are some of the skills that you need to have uh, on top of just like kind of your basic programming and design skills mm -hmm. to be successful at being a UI architect? So I'm, I'm going to answer the, the, the I'm going to start my answer with this, the same way I did before. There are so many JavaScript developers out there, which is great. I deeply love JavaScript myself. But if you're a JavaScript developer that doesn't understand HTML, and doesn't understand CSS, that's what blows my mind. People <laughs> right. can say, oh, I can build an entirely fault-tolerant Kubernetes cluster that is across multiple data centers, but uh, there's no way I could ever understand CSS. That's, that's a bridge too far for me. Right. So when we are talking about web developers, it is so crucial that you understand all three legs of the stool, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. You understand the semantics of HTML, because that's what leads to accessibility. Right. That's what leads to web services and all manner of things. CSS is not just colors and fonts. It's now layout. You can do declarative form validation in CSS. When you're filling out form fields, that can be expressed in CSS in a declarative way rather than using JavaScript in a more imperative way. But I'm glad that you said skills. Um, HTML, CSS, and JavaScript are all skills. I consider testing a skill, not a role. I think that is crucial. One of the things I've been talking about a lot recently are two Microsoft, or excuse me, two ThoughtWorks um, uh, open source projects, free and open source projects called Gage and Tyco. And they allow you to begin doing test-driven development on the front end. It allows you to be testing and including these tests, not just unit tests, which are important, but full spectrum testing. Um, these are the kinds of things that when I look at a junior developer, they might have one skill. It might be JavaScript. And then as I look them to expand, I expect them to be T-shaped developers where they can begin understanding HTML and CSS and testing and accessibility and performance and scalability and all of these things that go on. So these are all important skills. And it's so important for us to recognize that if you've got one skill, that's great. There are many more skills for you to acquire. So you're not done yet by any stretch. Right. That's actually a really good point. So when we 
we, we've been in this industry for a while, and we know that a lot of companies have software architects, or just architects. Yes. But those architects are nominally server-side architects. Yes, right? almost always, right? right? Yes. So, so why is it that we haven't had the rise of the UI architect until very recently? Like, what, how is the, why is the industry, sh like what's changed in the industry or what's shaping the fact that companies need to have a UI architect? Is it the complexity of the web or is it, you know, what, are the, what do you think are some of the factors that like now people are like, well, not only, only do we need server-side architects, but we also now need UI architects. So what do yes. you think some of the things that have happened that have kind of bubbled up this newfound position in, in companies called UI architect? You and I have known each other for a lot of years now. I won't count how many decades you and I have been, but I know that you and I uh, came to this industry very similar. You and I are both server-side Java developers. Uh, my first book for O'Reilly was JBoss at Work. So I deeply love server-side web development and Java development and those kinds of things. And I think that um, these roles naturally grew up to be architect-level folks because they got their start in the industry at, at the back end. Now, I had the opportunity in 2004 to work on Google Maps pre-release. I was working for a satellite imaging company in Denver that provided mm. all of the pixels for Google Maps. If you ever flipped over to satellite mode and zoomed in on your backyard, you were looking at my pixels. And I realized that there were incredibly taxing concerns about Google Maps. Now, first of all, Google Maps was not framework built. It was HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. But then all of a sudden you start having these things like, I have caching concerns. What do I do with all these map tiles that come down? I'm doing asynchronous requests all over the place. I need to manage multiple zoom levels. I need to be able to manage Google Maps on desktops and mobile devices as well. So all of a sudden, what was once something that was generated from the server side is now a thing unto itself, and it brings all those same concerns, performance and security and accessibility and really understanding the performance characteristics of mobile development versus desktop development. Um, mobile development, it takes five seconds to download one megabyte of JavaScript. And if you're on a 3G network, you feel this. And as a server-side Java developer, you don't feel the same way. You're never downloading those jars on the fly. You're never doing the compilation at runtime. So it does require a very different set of skills to be a web architect than it might um, to be a server-side uh, uh, architect just because of the natural uh, runtime characteristics and, and build time characteristics of the solutions that you're providing. No, you, you're absolutely right. I completely agree with you. But what do you think, if, if we're looking at the role of server-side architect and the role of a UI architect, where do you think they're overlapping things for those two roles? I'm not saying that a server-side architect can be a UI architect without some work, but, but what are some of the commonalities between a server-side and UI architect, in your opinion? So there are several things. Everyone is quite excited about the microservices pattern these days because we've, we've moved from kind of a monolithic back-end infrastructure to something that is very tightly focused. It's highly cohesive, it's loosely coupled, it's a good single purpose microservice that can be deployed independently of all these other microservices. This is a well understood, very appreciated pattern. On the front end, we're still dealing with monolithic JavaScript based frameworks. Oh, I never thought about that. Angular, yeah. React, Vue, I don't want, to, I'm not criticizing it there, I'm stating an objective fact that these are monolithic, many times opaque frameworks that are running on the front end. So there's this idea of micro front ends that if I have a shopping cart microservice, perhaps, just perhaps, we might want to have a corresponding front end set of W3C web components that are easy to install, that talk to that microservice, that give us that same cohesive set of user experiences, but also the granularity to update our shopping cart without having to update our catalog or update the login uh, authentication infrastructure or things like that. So I love the fact that these patterns that are well understood and appreciated at the server side are equally applicable on the client side. 
Reactive programming is wonderful. It took me a long time to get into this streaming mentality because web development has historically always been request response and connectionless. So moving to a streaming metaphor through reactive programming is really powerful. Well, when we're doing reactive programming on the server side, we can also do reactive programming on the client side. I can subscribe to a form, an HTML form, and it's either in a valid state or in an invalid state. And as the user is filling in those things, I can stream the state of that form and I can react to it in, in real time. So these patterns that we tend to think are only server side or more valuable on the server side, in fact, can be applied all over the place. And so as a chief web architect, if I can use the same language in speaking to a back-end architect, we can agree on the semantics of the words we're using. We can agree on the performance benefits and the characteristics and the architectural patterns. And so thinking that front-end development is fonts and colors here, here and there really misses the richness of the solution we can provide. Awesome. Thanks, Scott. Uh, we enjoyed talking to you today. Uh, Scott will be at UI ArcConf, um, so catch him there. And again, thank you for dropping some uh, wisdom and knowledge for us. Thanks, Scott. Thank you so much.